First of all, we would like to know why you have decided to write Playing the Enemy. Which was the purpose of writing this novel? Well, I wrote the book because I was, I was very, very fortunate and very privileged to get to know Nelson Mandela pretty well when I was um, living in South Africa as a journalist between 1989 and 1995, which were the, the epic years of political transition. And I wanted to write a book about Nelson Mandela to reflect my good fortune in, in having got to know him. Nelson Mandela is the greatest political leader I've ever met in 28 years as a journalist. And the greatest political event I've ever witnessed is the Rugby World Cup final of 1995. I say it's much more than a sports event. It's a, it's a political event, uh, an extraordinary moment of, of reconciliation in what was possibly the most divided country in the world. So you had the most remarkable man I've met and the most remarkable event, and so I put them together in, in a book. And my purpose was that I think, I feel that with that man, with that event, you saw the human animal at its best, at its most noble and most generous. And I wanted that example to be put down in a book and to remain there for posterity, for all people, everywhere. Um, you said in, a, in an interview that uh, the 20th century is characterized by two great men, Nelson Mandela and Adolf Hitler. Can you explain this sentence? Yeah, I think that um, I think Adolf Hitler and Nelson Mandela represent two absolutely opposite poles of humanity. What they had in common was that they were both great leaders. I don't say great in the sense of morally good, but they were people who could really lead, get people to follow them. Hitler used his gift of leadership in order to cause division, hatred, and death. And Mandela used his great gifts of leadership to generate reconciliation, unity, peace, and love. Um, you also said that uh, Francois Pienard was like an empty canvas where Mandela has painted his uh, great project. What does it mean? Uh, I'm not sure if Francois would be very happy to, to hear me say that. I know Francois very well now. He's a friend. Well, the thing about Francois Pinard, he was an ordinary man who happened to live in a, in a country which had extraordinary circumstances. It was this South Africa under apartheid was this, it was the epitome of racial discrimination in the world. But Francois Pinot was just an ordinary guy who didn't think very much about politics, like most people everywhere. And in his case, his obsession, his passion was playing rugby. And he invested all his energy, physical and intellectual, into his rugby, really. And so politically, yes, he was a, a white page. He was an empty canvas. And I think Mandela, him meeting Mandela, was the first really very significant political event in his life when his political consciousness awoke. And as happens with so many people who meet Mandela, he was immediately seduced. He was immediately, his heart and his mind were conquered by Mandela. And he decided that Mandela was the example to follow, the example to emulate. And he became a disciple of Nelson Mandela, and a very important disciple, and a very useful disciple, uh, a very useful political instrument for Nelson Mandela. And to this day, now, many years later, you speak to Francois Pinar about Mandela, and he talks about Mandela as if it's his beloved grandfather. He talks about Mandela and he, he, he cries. You were in Ellis Park on June 24th. Tell us something about uh, the special atmosphere of, of that day, the atmosphere of the final. What do you remember most of, of the final? I think the, the most amazing thing was on the morning of that day, how even before the game began, the whole country was united. 
you have to understand just how divided this country was. You know, it was, it was almost, it was almost a caricature of, of human division. You know, it was just between blacks and whites and, and the different shades in between. Everybody was divided, everybody was, was fighting, everybody had a history of resentment. And on this morning, for the first time since the arrival of the first white settlers in 1652, for the first time in all those years, the whole country shared one common objective. It had never happened before. And the common objective was for the South African rugby team, the Springboks, which had been hated by black people for decades. The common objective now, everybody, black, white, brown, Muslim, Christian, Jew, everybody, had one common purpose, they wanted South Africa to win that game. That's the, I think, maybe the most important thing. But in terms of the atmosphere in the stadium, the fact is that 90%, 95% of the people there were white. The rugby people were not known for their political enlightenment. Uh, they're traditionally quite a racist group of people. And the great moment, the best moment, even better than the game, was when Mandela went out onto the field before the game wearing the green Springbok shirt, which was the shirt of the enemy. I mean, this is almost, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but it's almost as if after the Second World War, some Jewish leader comes out wearing a Nazi shirt. I'm exaggerating, but not too much, because this green shirt was a symbol of decades of, of racial oppression, a symbol of the people who kept Mandela himself in prison for 27 years, a symbol of Mandela's jailers. And he came out wearing that shirt, and it was a, gest a gesture of extraordinary generosity. It was him reaching out to his white compatriots and saying, I offer you my hand, will you take my hand? And the beautiful thing was that his white compatriots, who'd hated and feared him, took his hand and started chanting his name. And the whole stadium erupted with a, with a cry of Nelson, Nelson, Nelson. And that, for me, is the single most moving political moment I've seen in my life. If I'm not wrong, uh, you have said that uh, you have tried the the inspiration for writing this novel, talking to um, uh, an, a babysitter from I, I, Iran, is it true? You're very, you're very, very well informed. Yes, you have very good intelligence sources. It's true, the actual, the, the, the catalyst for this book was, I, I, worked, I, 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 wrote, I, I worked in a television documentary about Nelson Mandela's life, a big two-hour documentary which I interviewed many, many people. Um, and I did this in 1998, 1999. And um, I was in England in the beginning of the year 2000, staying with some South African friends. And I went out to have dinner with them. And they had two small children. They had a babysitter who was of Iranian origin. She was, I think, English, Iranian, but Iranian family. And when we were away at, at the restaurant, she stayed and she watched the video of this documentary. And when we came back from dinner, she said to me she would really loved it. And she'd especially loved the bit at the end, which at the end of the documentary was about the Rugby World Cup final of 1995. And this immediately got me thinking. I thought, my goodness, this girl, you know, who has no interest in rugby, no interest in South Africa, no interest in Mandela, and yet for her, the really moving moment <coughs> was this Rugby World Cup final of 95. I thought, here is a story, <coughs> and this is the story around which I can build my book, my celebration of Nelson Mandela. Let's talk about the movie. Um, when, when have you met uh, Morgan Freeman for the first time? In Mississippi? In, in February of 2006, I wrote a synopsis, a proposal for a book in 10 pages. I summarized my book and I sent it to publishers, hoping that one would say they wanted to publish it. And I got a publisher in New York, and I was very happy. But then my agent, who's in New York, sent these 10 pages to Hollywood. She thought maybe someone might want to build a film around this. Anyway, I received some phone calls from people in Hollywood. I had meetings, and some people were interested. And in June 2006, four months after I wrote this, this synopsis, I was working on a newspaper story in Mississippi. I was in a small town in Mississippi. Really, it was a complete chance, coincidence, that I was in this town, in this day, on this moment. And on this day, 
in this moment, Morgan Freeman arrived in this tower. At the same time I arrived by, by car, he arrived in his private plane, which he's a pilot in his own private plane. And I had, I had one contact in this town for the story. I was writing a story about poverty in the south of the United States. And, um, and this one contact knew Morgan Freeman. So he introduced me to Morgan Freeman. And I, I wasn't making any connections. I wasn't thinking movie. I was thinking, great, I'm going to meet Morgan Freeman. Fantastic. I'll shake his hand. Wonderful. But then I saw Morgan Freeman again that evening in the house of this man who was my contact. And when the man who was the owner of the house, he went to the kitchen to get a bottle of Californian Sauvignon Blanc wine. And I stayed in the room with Morgan Freeman. And I said, suddenly I had a moment of inspiration. I said, Mr. Freeman, this is your lucky day. I have a movie for you. And he said, oh, really? What's it about? And I replied, it's about an event that distills the essence of Mandela's genius and the essence of the South African miracle. And he said, oh, you mean the rugby game? And I thought, what? You know, how can you make the connection? And he said he'd read my 10-page synopsis. He was already interested. And we spent the next two hours, we had dinner together, talking, talking, talking all night about South Africa. At the end of the dinner, he gave me his email address, his private email address, and he gave me a wink, and he said, I think we're going to stay in contact. And a few months later, we, we, we reached an agreement that his production company in Hollywood would buy the rights to my book. And this is how we now have this movie. <laughs> is the movie faithful, faithful to the novel or, 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 or not? The, the book has um, a lot more historical context, inevitably. I mean, you, you can't put everything. A film has to be much more economic and has to focus on the essential story. So the film is really about the second half of my book. And, um, but I think that the, um, the question is not so much if the movie is faithful to my book as if it's faithful to the story. I mean, my book is only a reflection of the story too. You can also ask a question, is my book faithful to the real story? But I think that the film is faithful to the real story. Um, the first time I saw it was in Paris and I was, I was nervous. Uh, and at the end of it, I just felt great. When it finished, I just sat there and I felt happy and I felt proud and I thought they really captured the spirit of the story. I think N Morgan Freeman captured the spirit of Nelson Mandela beautifully. And I think Clint Eastwood captured the spirit of that time in South Africa very well. I think the essence of the story is communicated beautifully. You said that uh, Nelson Mandela never gave the poem to Francois Pienaar. No, well look, uh, it's Hollywood and, they, and you have to have some little fictions. Um, but there are, there are still, like I say, I insist, faithful to the spirit of that time. And that poem, it's very important to know, was of great value to Nelson Mandela. He did read that poem in Victus when he was in prison. It gave him courage. It helped him through the incredible personal difficulty. I mean, being in this tiny, tiny little cell, this is a tall, big man for all those years. And it helped him a lot. And in fact, and, and the poem continued to be of importance to him many years later. His son died of AIDS about four or five years ago. And at the funeral of the son, they read out that poem. So that wasn't a fiction. The, the movie's right in that the poem is very important to Mandela. Um, but as far as I know, in real life, Mandela did not give the poem to, to Francois Pinard, the captain. Just two questions. Mm. But I, I want to say one thing, though. But, si non è vero, è ben trovato. <laughs> What's your opinion about um, the work done by Clint Eastwood and Matt Damon? Clint Eastwood, I was there on, in, in the film, I was watching the, the film being made in South Africa and I was amazed at Clint Eastwood and the serene, good-humoured, totally professional control that he has over this enormous logistical operation, which is this film. I was just 
also very impressed by how he really captured the spirit of that time in South Africa. I was watching the film being made and it was like being transported 15, 16 years back uh, in time. And, and I met Clint Eastwood and I spoke to him quite a bit and I liked him very much. Um, he's a man, he has a wonderful quality that he, he does not take himself seriously but he takes his work very seriously. And in that, he's like Morgan Freeman. And Morgan Freeman and Clint Eastwood have a very, very good human relationship. They, 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 have, a, they have a lot of jokes, they have a lot of fun, they really understand each other. Matt Damon, I thought Matt Damon did a fantastic job as Francois Pinard. There's one very difficult thing to do, which is the, the South African accent in English. It's very difficult. Many Hollywood actors have tried it, and they've always failed. And Matt Damon is the first one who's got the accent, absolutely nailed it. And I, I like the way he played the role. He, he played the role of Francois Pina in a way that let the Morgan Freeman Mandela character have the lights, have dominate the stage. He was sort of, he, he stood back. And I thought that was a very proper way to do it. And Matt Damon personally, I know Matt Damon, and I like him very much. He's, he's a very, very intelligent guy, very normal and uh, very kind, very nice. Matt Damon is a, is a terrific guy. I mean, I think Matt Damon, Clint Eastwood, and Morgan Freeman are three. Forget them as famous people. They're three just fantastic people. They really are. They're, they're, they're wonderful individuals. How do you see the future of South Africa? Can the um, Football World Cup have the same meaning as the Rugby World Cup? I don't think the Football World Cup will have the same political significance, no, because in 1995 when the Rugby World Cup happened, um, South Africa was in a very delicate, fragile, tense condition. The democracy was very young, very fragile, very threatened, and it was very, very important to find something to bring the country together. South Africa is not at that stage now. South African democracy is now solid. It's a strong democracy. Uh, the institutions are solid. There is no possibility of any terrorist, right-wing terrorism. Or The problems now in South Africa are different So for the future of South Africa. South Africa's problems now are not black and white race. It's not the priority. The priority is the economy, the poverty, crime, corruption, education, public education. These are the challenges now, which are challenges that face so many countries around the world. South Africa has now lost its epic uniqueness. It's no longer a country that is just so separate, so different from the rest. And so the question is, will they address these problems of poverty and crime and corruption in education? Because if they don't, the country in, in 5, 10, 15, 20 years could be in a lot of trouble. And I think South Africa has a big responsibility. South Africa is by far the richest country in Africa, by far the most sophisticated democracy. You know, the rule of law works very well, freedom of the press, it's a real strong, robust democracy. But there is a possibility that if they don't address the problems, especially of poverty and of crime, that the country could fall into the hands of populists, of demagogues, of people who do not, who forget the spirit of Nelson Mandela. People maybe who will try to inflame racial tensions that isn't really the point now, but you can see people trying to use that in a cynical way to get power. So I think South Africa is, is at a bit of a crossroads and we'll have to see whether it, it continues to become this exemplary democracy or whether it will become chaotic and fall into the hands of, of populists. And I think the World Cup maybe can help a little bit in reminding South Africa of the best about it and hope that it goes down the root of good, the root of Mandela, rather than what could be a dangerous populist route. Last question, what are you going to do now? What's your project? Have you got special projects like this novel or? It's going to be very, very difficult for me to find a subject to write about in a book that is as important to me as this and that has characters so epic. So fantastic. Um, but right now I'm developing an idea. It's a secret. I can't tell you about it. <laughs> but I'm developing an idea maybe for a story for a film. You know, by, by very, by great good fortune, 
I now have these amazing contacts in Hollywood. You know, I'm very surprised this has happened. But now, you know, many people can have an idea for a movie, but then what do they do with it? Now I can have an idea for a movie and I can get it to important people. So I'm developing an idea for a film which is based on my experience as a foreign correspondent and and we'll see. Maybe maybe nothing will happen, but maybe we'll remember this conversation sometime in the future and we can talk about that.